Section 14, an instructive episode. Here, it is proper to relate an episode which, in spite of its modest dimensions, does not badly illustrate the difference between their morals and ours. In 1935, through a letter to my Belgian friends, I developed the conception that the attempt of a young revolutionary party to organize its own trade unions is equivalent to suicide. It is necessary to find the workers where they are, but this means paying dues in order to sustain an opportunist apparatus? Of course, I replied, for the right to undermine the reformists, it is necessary temporarily to pay them a contribution. But reformists will not permit us to undermine them? True, I answered. Undermining demands conspirative measures. Reformists are the political police of the bourgeoisie within the working class. We must act without their permission and against their interdiction. Through an accidental raid on Comrade D.'s home, in connection, if I am not mistaken, with the matter of supplying arms for the Spanish workers, the Belgian police seized my letter. Within several days, it was published. The press of Vandervelde, De Man, and Spock did not, of course, spare lighting against my Machiavellianism and Jesuitism. And who are these accusers? Vandervelde, president for many years of the Second International, long ago became a trusted servant of Belgian capital. Daimon, who in a series of ponderous tomes ennobled socialism with idealistic morals, making overtures to religion, sees the first suitable occasion in which to betray the workers and become a common bourgeois minister. Even more lovely is Spock's case. A year and a half previously, this gentleman belonged to the left socialist opposition and came to me in France for advice upon the methods of struggle against Vandervelde's bureaucracy. I set forth the same conceptions which later constituted my letter. But within a year after his visit, Spock rejected the thorns for the roses. Betraying his comrades of the opposition, he became one of the most cynical ministers of Belgian capital. In the trade unions and in their own party, these gentlemen stifle every critical voice, systematically corrupt and bribe the most advanced workers, and just as systematically expel the refractory ones. They are distinguished from the GPU only by the fact that they have not yet resorted to spilling blood. As good patriots, they husband the workers' blood for the next imperialist war. Obviously, one must be a hellish abomination, a moral deformation, a kafir, a Bolshevik, in order to advise the revolutionary workers to observe the precepts of conspiracy and the struggle against these gentlemen. From the point of view of the Belgian laws, my letter did not, of course, contain anything criminal. The duty of the democratic police was to return the letter to the addressee with an apology. The duty of the Socialist Party was to protest against the raid, which had been directed by concern over General Franco's interests. But Monsieur's Socialists were not at all shy at utilizing the indecent police service. Without this, they could not have enjoyed the happy occasion of once more exposing the superiority of their morals over the amoralism of the Bolsheviks. Everything is symbolical in this episode. The Belgian Social Democrats dumped the buckets of their indignation upon me exactly while their Norwegian co-thinkers held me and my wife under lock and key in order to prevent us from defending ourselves against the accusations of the GPU. The Norwegian government well knew that the Moscow accusations were spurious. The Social Democratic semi-official newspaper affirmed this openly during the first days. But Moscow touched the Norwegian ship owners and fish merchants on the pocketbook, and Monsieur's Social Democrats immediately flopped down on all fours. The leader of the party, Martin Tranmel, is not only an authority in the moral sphere, but openly a righteous person. He does not drink, does not smoke, does not indulge in meat, and in winter bathes in an ice hole. 
This did not hinder him, after he had arrested us upon the order of the GPU, from especially inviting a Norwegian agent of the GPU, one Jacob Fries, a bourgeois without honor or conscience, to calumniate me. But enough. The morals of these gentlemen consists of conventional precepts and turns of speech, which are supposed to screen their interests, appetites, and fears. In the majority, they are ready for any baseness, rejection of convictions, perfidy, betrayal, in the name of ambition or cupidity. In the holy sphere of personal interests, the end to them justifies any means. But it is precisely because of this that they require special codes of morals, durable and at the same time elastic, like good suspenders. They detest anyone who exposes their professional secrets to the masses. In peaceful times, their hatred is expressed in slander, in Billingsgate or philosophical language. In times of sharp social conflicts, as in Spain, these moralists, hand in hand with the GPU, murder revolutionists. In order to justify themselves, they repeat, Trotskyism and Stalinism are one and the same.